with us in studio is Mike Giardi of Boston Sports Journal. Talking a little bit about his report yesterday about uh, Bill Belichick kind of understanding where he where he is at this point. Uh, but the conversation with ownership hasn't necessarily happened yet, which to me, Mike, kind of keeps the door open for this not being done. Yeah. Right. You know, if they haven't if they haven't sat down and said, all right, Bill, you're in your final weeks here, then there's still the opportunity that the Monday after the season, they sit down and say, all right. Let's figure this out. Let's figure out how we can make this work next season. Yeah, it's crazy to me that that something that could happen here over the last month could have could turn the thing in one direction or another. Like, look, I get if if they pull a Brandon Staley Chargers and lose sixty three to fourteen, like, okay, they gave up on Bill. They're not playing for Bill anymore. That's it. The 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 deal's done. But like, oh, they're competitive. Oh, they won some games. Show up on Christmas Eve in a right. game that they could absolutely have just you know. Yep falling flat on their face and they win on national TV. But then you're like, so really that we're going to take the final four weeks instead of the last four and a half years and say that that's the different. Yep. Nope. That's the guy we want. That's the guy we want leading the program going forward. That to me is crazy. And to me, if that is legitimately still part of their thought process, that something that something has happened here, could happen in the final two weeks that could convince them that he's the guy. Then to me, I don't think then if that's the case, Again, just speculating. If that's the case, then they don't really want to get rid of him. Can Bob Kraft – we had this discussion early this morning. Can Bob Kraft separate the emotion of this and the the whole you don't want to be the person who got rid of Brady and Belichick and all – because all that – because as I said earlier, if you take all that out of the equation and you just say last four years Mm -hmm. and what this team was and Belichick has his hands in all of it, There's really no case to be made that he should stay, but you can't divorce yourself from all of that because that's the reason that you are what you are. That's the reason that the Patriots are so well thought of is, you know, he's such a big part of it. Yeah. So Phil, when we started having this conversation, having it here with, with, with rich Fred, you know, (laughs) when Rich was still here, John Wallach having that conversation. And I remember like, they're like, he's gotta be gone. And I'm like, Look, all signs point in that direction, and this is long before the Tom report that sort of really helped, I think, solidify it for a lot of people. But I'm like, this is weird to say, but until they do it, I don't have faith that they're going to do it. And I think Robert has shown you, Robert, he doesn't just like to be loved. He loves to be loved. And even though he can say, well, the Brady thing was, was Bill, not me. Well, you're the one who let him have the contract that didn't say you said we couldn't franchise you. Right. Like you're that guy. You're the guy who, even though you helped keep it together for years, you couldn't figure out a way to keep it at the end. So I'm sorry, but that's still on your resume. You got six rings and saved the franchise and all these things, but that's on your resume. Now does he want the Bill Belichick thing? And of course the fear that everybody has. It's not just them, it's the fan base. Well, what if he goes somewhere else and wins? And what if the guy you replace him with sucks? Well, yeah, all all possible. All those things could happen, absolutely. Or he could go somewhere else and be the same guy he's been here for the last four years, and the guy that you replace him with, be it Gerard Mayo or someone else, could reinvigorate the program that's gotten incredibly stale. The the word that I've heard, I'm sure Phil's heard it too from down there, is you know the the modernizing the operation that under Bill – older staler that sort of like no we got to get into the to the modern age of football here and we have to move this thing forward well maybe whoever that guy is and whoever the gm is allows you to do that and then all of a sudden instead of being stuck in this morass of seven and nine eight and nine now four and eleven you're back into competing for a playoff spot and the arrows back to pointing upward and you have an opportunity maybe to not just compete for the playoffs but compete for the thing that they did for so many years, and that's for Super Bowls. What I keep coming back to when it comes to why haven't they met is this. Have they not met because the status quo is going to hold and he's going to remain under contract and he's going to remain here in New England and be the head coach? Or have they not met yet because at 4-11, and nothing really needs to be said. (laughs) Yeah, We all know where this is going. And we want it to end as nicely as we can. If your ownership, especially, I think that's important to Robert. 
We want there to be a relationship at the end. We want Bill Belichick to come back for the Patriots Hall of Fame induction, and we want to be out there for the Canton Hall of Fame I, induction for him. I asked you last week, and I want to ask you, Mike, like, is there any way that you would see that decision being made before the last game? Before the so that so that there can be a public pronouncement, so that there can be a little bit of recognition before that Jets game that this is Bill's swan song with us, and we can all go out on a happy note. I don't think Bill would be one who'd want to partake in that. I still think you could do it. I mean, if you're the Crafts, like we're just letting you know, people, this is it for him. Now, he doesn't have to participate. He can deflect all the questions at press conferences, but like we want whatever it is, 68,000 people in full throat at the stadium. And we want you to give Bill a send off, even if Bill is not um, going to publicly acknowledge that the send off is happening. And to me, like, you know, you could be whatever, four and 12, five and 11. If you upset the bills, like there's not a lot of reason to go to that football game. Like there could be, and, and we've seen it in recent weeks at home. Yeah. Been pretty empty. There's, there's a, there's a good reason to be at the game. Like you, I'm at Bill Belichick's last game and yeah, it's gone like crap the last four years basically, but I appreciate what he did for me for 20 years. And the fact that we had parade after parade after parade and we played in AFC championship games and we had so many unbelievable moments in this stadium. Like I want to be there for that. And I want to say thank you. Even if he's not going to wave to the crowd and acknowledge that it's happening. Does that conversation, whenever it happens, say say it does happen before the season finale. Is there a percentage chance, however small, that that leads to the explosive moment you're trying to avoid as ownership? Again, we're trying to maintain a relationship here. We're trying to maintain an asset here. We, we'd love to, even if we've decided already we're going to move on from this guy. We'd love to get something back for him. The best opportunity for us to do that is to try to, at some level, be simpatico on the way out. And so is opening the door to that meeting before the season ends, opening the door to the kind of moment you've been trying to avoid all year. You're just, you just you don't want to have that painful conversation because you don't know how it's going to go. You're not sure how Bill Belichick's going to react. So why have you've gotten this far. Why potentially blow it up and burn that bridge before the season even ends, because that's the thing you've been trying to okay. avoid this entire time. To, let me let me introduce this because we I said well, I wanted to ask you about this, and this enters into the conversation about you know is Phil saying like kind of controlling the asset and potentially dealing Bill Belichick as opposed to firing him or you know letting him walk to to somewhere else for free. Is Bill Belichick still as good of a coach as we have come to know him over the years, given what you were talking about, your conversation with Slater about being the other team now, right? The team that makes those dumb mistakes, the team that takes bad penalties at the wrong time, the team that turns the ball over when you can't. You're that team. You were never that team. For Mm -hmm. 20-plus years, you were never that team, and you have been for a while now. So is he still the coach that, he was for a good chunk of his career here. No, I, I, no, <laughs> because this enters into the question yeah. about could, if you brought in a GM to handle the personnel stuff, is he still the best option to be your, your head coach? So he's to me, he's not. And I think the proof is in the pudding with the record. The proof is in the pudding with the, with the sloppy play. Although I, I will give the defense some credit here. I think Andrew Callahan had the number. Was it 11 penalties over the last seven games, which is pretty, pretty good considering, but they've, clearly become a kind of a group unto themselves here <laughs> and sort of separated themselves from the, from the offensive uh, lack of production and whatnot. But when I say Bill's not the same coach as he was, and I think again, the the record and all these different things tell you it's true. It doesn't mean he's still not a really good coach. Mm-hmm. Like I thought going into the year, I remember we, we had the conversation because, you know, someone had a list, your top, you know, did the top coaches and, Someone had him like fifth or seventh or whatever. Someone had him third. And I was like, to me, he's like, he's 9-10. 9-10. I'm like, no. well, I mean, again, the just I'm going based on the last three and a half years of football coming into this year. Like, to me, I can't separate that. And obviously this year there were a lot of things that happened that uh, would not have happened uh, when Bill was at the top of his game or when – Bill had Tom Brady at the top of his game, and that that trickle down effect is evident. Um, 
I still think, and I think we saw it against Denver, he can he can still scheme it up. He can still, you know, he's still pretty good situationally. It's ultra conservative. I think we've seen that. But I, but again, maybe that plays into the quarterback and and not trusting the offense. Um, so he's not the same guy, but he's still pretty good. And everyone I've spoken to that's worked with him and worked with him closely <clears throat> over the last few years has said he's still he's still the same guy. He is still with it when it comes to X's and O's and game planning. He's still all there, right? My counter to that would just be that being the head coach goes beyond that. It's not just about putting a game plan together. It's not even just about scheming it up anymore. It's about the teaching part of it, which I know he respects and appreciates, and he loves that part of his job. But there have been portions of the football operation that have fallen by the wayside entire phases of the game, special teams and offense. The teaching's not been good enough there. There's also a a bedside manner quotient to this job, especially now in 2023. Look at Mike McDaniel. Look at Dan Campbell. Look at some of the, you know, D'Amico Ryan, some of the young coaches in today's game that are having a lot McVay, of success. McVay. Sean like McVay. The job he's done. Kyle Shanahan to a degree, though I think he's probably more old school, even though he's a younger guy. He's more old school than some of those others. Part of being a head coach now is getting players to play for you. It's a There's a motivational aspect to the job that I don't think has always been there, especially sure. once Bill Belichick became head coach. And so it's just it's different. How you relate to players in today's game is different. And, and I wonder if you factor in all of those things, if you're another owner out there and you're looking at Bill Belichick, what are you willing to give up? How do, how do the players feel about it? Well, it's interesting. And Phil, as I was driving in, I heard Phil bring up the, you know, the David Andrews uh, in the post game shown on Patriots.com saying, you know, we tried to do this for you. Um, I think it's an interesting mix, though, of I'm trying to put this. All right. Don't put it kindly. No, just no, it, just I'm just all hang I'm, I'm, I was going. Listening. No, I was going to say something before. So, like to me, what the defense has done is not a reflection on Bill, but it's a reflection on Gerard Mayo and Stephen Belichick and DeMarcus Covington, who I think is a is an up-and-comer, the defensive line coach. And I asked um, DeMarcus about Gerard because, and, and I think when you talk about Gerard, I think some people tend to put Gerard and Steve in the same bucket, and even though they're different personalities, as we know, Steve's not someone who kind of leads the room. But Steve has a lot of respect from those guys. They like playing for him. They like him. Uh, but Gerard is more the leader of that group. And talking to DeMarcus yesterday, and I wrote this up for Boston Sports Journal, just, you know, talking about the growth of Gerard and, like, yeah, it's one thing to, you know, he we know he was a leader as a player. Obviously, a first-round pick. He was a captain. There's a lot of things that he did. But he said, he talked about the, I'm going to screw it up, but, like, the power of the tongue, I think is how, is how he phrased it. Ooh. And he said he can <laughs> settle down. Yeah, I know he said, <laughs> but he said he can speak to these players and speak the truth into them. And he can speak to them in a manner in which maybe other guys can't, in which he's able to extract like, all right, you're not confident. Gerard can give you confidence or he can have the honest conversation with you. You're not doing this well enough. We need more from you. And instead of that person walk, walking away from Gerard going bleepity bleepity bleep, the guy's like, no, he's right. I can do this. I can be better, and I will do it. And I thought it was, um, I thought it was kind of an awesome answer from Demarcus because as we're getting all these varying reports about Mayo and people starting to drag their feet about, well, he's never been a coordinator, and how could they do this? Like, I don't know. Th- there is there is something about him being a leader of men that, to Phil's point about these younger coaches, I think is really important. And I think you're seeing, even though I don't like some of the selfish nature of some of the defensive guys and how it's gone here and some of the things they've said, and even Gerard admitted, like, it's hard to sort of not look at the offense at times and be like, what are you guys doing? We're doing our part. Can you can you just pick it up a little bit? But that they've been able to stay together, I think speaks a lot about him and, dare I say again, Stephen Belichick as being pretty important to that whole operation. And it makes me think of, like, I don't know. You know, like, I know there's been some doubt now. I don't, I have less doubt about Gerard than I did 
going into the process. See, and that's where you can have a coach, a head coach who's a CEO, and you can have the X's, you know, you can bring in coordinators to be the X's and O's guy. Mm -hmm. If you've got that kind of leader at the top that can just kind of keep everything moving forward, keep everybody on the same page, make the decisions on game day, that's a, you know, it's it's not what you're necessarily used to here, but it can work that way. Well, Dan Campbell, never an offensive coordinator. Yeah. Uh, Mike McDaniel, never an offensive coordinator. John Harbaugh. Right. Special old school coach, special teams coordinator, but never called offensive or defensive plays. It, it it works out okay for those guys. Harbaugh's, a, I think, the best example. Yep. You don't necessarily need that if you have the other stuff. And but, it seems like Mayo does have a lot of the other stuff. I remember talking to you. Remember the Jalen Mills tweet from a, this is maybe from a couple weeks ago now, though. And just out of the blue, he tweeted something along the lines of, it's amazing what can happen for a player if a coach just shows a little bit of belief in them. And it was like, whoa, really? Is that <laughs> that we're just tweeting things like that now from the Patriots locker room? It's, it's gone that way for and, a few of the well, And, <laughs> and I asked him, I asked him after the fact, was, was that about here in New England? Is it? No, 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 no. I'm glad you asked me about that, which, you know, okay, right. let's, let's take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I guess. Just, just bring it up. The, but just bring it, it up old Give him the opportunity, <laughs> give him the opportunity to respond. Coach. And he was saying, yeah. I was talking about it with Demarcus Covington. Yeah, things were going well and silly. Yeah, you know, you can see it happen at the college level. You can see it happen at the pro level. Just feeling that from the person that you're working for, that you're playing for, can bring all of this other stuff out of you. Cam Newton, I'm, I'm on my Twitter timeline, he apparently has a podcast now, which I had never heard of before, but he's on the Twitter timeline talking about quarterbacks. And if you just get that sense of belief because the people around you have, surra have surrounded you with the proper talent and they're pumping you up in a certain way that allows you to be a confident player once you get on the field, that makes all the difference in the world. And it's just not happening here, it seems like, with young players because they've missed in the draft, there's no doubt, but the development side of it, too, has missed. And I wonder if it's because, I think it's fair to wonder if it's because of the way the head coach goes about his business and the way he tries to motivate, which is old school, which is put the pressure on, see how they respond. When you overcome adversity and you perform well in those situations, that's how you become a confident player. It's not from anything I'm going to tell you, and I, I think it's changed. I think the dynamics with players in today's game have changed where Bill Belichick saying a nice word to a player could go a long way in impacting right. that player's performance.